Hello and welcome to the Sai AI podcast. This is episode number 37. Today, my guest is Sankrant Sanu. What an extreme privilege and honor to have you here, Sankrant. Uh Sankrant is an author, entrepreneur and intellectual who is the founder and CEO of the publishing house Garuda Prakashan. He spent 9 years at Microsoft Corporation in various engineering and management roles. and then left the IT career to focus on personal growth in the yoga traditions and working towards a plural sustainable world he is an advocate for indigenous cultures and languages with his best seller book titled the english medium myth <coughs> my first question is so i've read this uh, book from j sai deepak recently called india that is bharat which shares views about decolonizing indian minds you've also talked about decolonization you know i've heard it at uh, jaipur dialogues on sanjay dikshit ji's show uh, but uh, i mean if you can share your views again about how do you think how we can decolonize our pupil i mean it's a humongous task there must be a how there must be a way to do it uh, but before that please share with our viewers why is it also important to decolonize in the first place sure sure yeah i think it's a very uh, vast question we could easily spend the entire hour talking about this so let me go from right. uh, from something which is accessible and simple it may seem like a trivial example but of course in our mathematics we were taught that the numbers that we are using are called arabic numbers we we call them arabic numbers because europeans got them from the arabs and so when the europeans colonized us and they changed our entire curriculum they taught those numbers to us as arabic numbers and this is how the current generation of indians often studied them of course the arabs themselves calls the num- call the numbers hind say <laughs> you know and and the arab sources are very clear that all of this not only the numbers but the mathematics came from india and the arab sources refer to it as you know uh, hisab um, al hind kitab al hind this you know that kind of uh, references are there so phenomenon that we have to look at is why is it that several generations of indians continued to study these numbers as arabic numbers and we had kind of erased our own memory of our mathematics of 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 the numbers and we had taken on the gaze of the europeans to look at ourselves so this example as i said is a very trivial example it's meant to be more fun than anything else but but this is the central problem of colonization and um, <clears throat> professor balu balaganga there in belgium who i follow his work i follow um and he's given me quite a few insights one of the statements he makes is colonization is immoral it robs us of our own experience colonization takes away our own direct perception of our experience and rather than looking at our society as it is looking at aspects of our society as it is we are constantly looking at even ourselves from the go- gaze of the the colonizer another example of this which is non trivial uh, and needs a lot more exploration is the notion of caste everybody talks about caste and hindus are supposed to have a caste system and it's hierarchical it's been static for 5000 years this is the standard story that we are taught in our textbooks about caste this is the standard story that something like mandal commission quotes, quotes about caste when it when it makes far reaching laws in indian society this story is again a story that is coming from the gaze of the colonizer and not from our own experience and one of the ways to excavate this again is colon decolonization must happen on different levels but the very first level is our own personal state all of us are colonized i am colonized you are colonized we are all colonized to some a uh, greater or lesser extent the first task for us is that we as individuals look at what are our concepts what are our notions and ask where did this come from for instance this notion of caste as hierarchy 
that interesting ha- incident that happened in my own family where i'm i'm i don't belong to a court brahmin jati um, or uh, you know upper caste jati in that sense but in my own family um, my my cousin which comes uh, who comes from a little conservative part of her family she uh, met this uh, this boy in uh, in her workplace and 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 they became fond of each other and they wanted to marry now the boy was a brahmin boy and as i said we are we are quote lower caste in comparison to that caste if caste is a hierarchy um, right and <clears throat> but the maximum resistance to that marriage came not from the brahmin family but it came from the conservative part of of my of my extended family which you know from where where my cousin uh, was so if caste is a hierarchy why mm-hmm. would court lower caste person object to marrying to a higher caste person because it mm. should be social climbing this is how hierarchies go right they would be happy right. to be social climbing higher right and in fact recently mm. there was a there was a news incident where somebody again this is a category invented invented category called dalit it's a colonial category right. you have <clears throat> an invented category called dalit and some dalit family i think they kill somebody i don't know i don't remember if it was the boy or the girl but one one or the other because again they were marrying into a court higher caste uh, right so so very simple episode stories show that if if this were true that that the ca- caste is a hierarchy and this is how it proceed then these stories would make no sense why would why would the lower caste be objecting to marrying high you know mm-hmm. it's like it's like saying if it's a social hierarchy then then a commoner's a daughter would there be a lot of resistance to them marrying into royalty or something you know that wouldn't happen right. it'd be the other way around royalty would object right. to marrying, marrying a commoner not the other way around relating back to your question which is why is decolonization necessary and how what is the process of decolonization when we distort our own experience when we take all this material that has been thrust upon us to to uh, filter our experience of ourselves so so many people just go around repeating these phrases caste is hierarchy caste system is terrible you know nobody can actually explain what the caste system is they'll right. take code of the manusmriti they'll take some that <laughs> but then i ask them okay tell me how many brahmins discriminated against you in your life mm-hmm. why are you so, so against them and they can't find a single example from their own life right? right so it is just it is just some filtering of stuff that has been put into our head it's indoctrination of a format mm-hmm. and it never it actually does not relate to our life at all they are they will mm-hmm. hardly be able to find one example and then say no 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 it is structural discrimination it's systematic you know some cash catch phrases that they are picking up so so the first important thing is colonization decolonization is necessary because it robs us of our own experience and because it distorts our own experience we are neither able to understand the real problems that we have right and mm-hmm. I'm, i'm not saying this to say there is no problem in india there is no discrimination right. in india i'm not saying the opposite so we should be very clear you know right. i'm not pretending that india is some kind of you know jannat i'm not saying that what i'm saying is that because of the way our gaze is distorted we can mm-hmm. neither understand our problems and because we cannot understand our problem we cannot also come up with the right solutions mm-hmm. um, and because we keep creating we have these imaginary problems to which we create imaginary solutions uh mm-hmm. those solutions never actually solve the problems there is no study for instance even if you take something like like reservation right there is no measure that the indian government has put into place and saying okay this is right. the measure we are looking at which says this is the problem this is trying to solve and when this measure reaches this point this problem will be solved right mm-hmm. there is no way so you can never go to be reserve anybody because if if you were solving a problem then you'd say okay this is the problem statement this is my solution this is how i will know that the problem is solved right but the the, the problem of caste is infinitely incorrigible and that mm-hmm. it is unsolvable in fact the more you would even say after 
70 years of quote anti caste policies there seems right. to be increasing we have people even makes the narrative oh casteism is happening casteism is happening so why is it that we we had a problem we devised a solution and rather than solving anything the problem seems to be increasing obviously we either don't understand the problem or or our solutions are completely wacky so this this we keep repeating this this happens at every area this happens for instance take dowry laws we've created these draconian dowry laws why because dowry is social evil again we, mm-hmm. we take these terms we take these terms from a christian gaze onto our mm-hmm. society we, we use words like evil you can take something okay so how do you prove it is evil you say oh well you know so and so got you know you you burnt a bride um, and you know brides are being killed because of dowry of course it is evil there was a book uh, it's called dowry murder by Vina Oldenburg one of the points that she makes is that there are more people actually killed in the US by spouses for insurance than they're wow. killed in India for dowry <laughs> So, but they don't, they haven't created a cultural crime called insurance murder, where we hack right. the culture because of insurance killings, right? right? But but this is made into a cultural crime. This is another aspect of colonization, where a crime in a colonial society hangs the society. You make that mm. a, a narrative about society. You don't say, well, mm. wow, this, this person was a criminal, look, look what he did, he murdered his wife. That's not the right. narrative. They say, no, 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 society itself is criminal, right? Society is corrupt. We, right. we such a, why is society corrupt? Because we are immoral. Why are we immoral? Because we are not Christian. This is, this is the <laughs> backdrop of that narrative. It comes from that missionary narrative that is created. That mm-hmm. is, we have internalized, right? And that internalized narrative we keep repeating. And now what do we do? We create draconian rowry laws. That, that has not prevented the giving of whatever might happen in marriage all that is still continuing why is it continuing we haven't asked the question but at the same time it has it has caused lots of conflict in families it is causing you know people to be thrown into jail without recourse because that we have this aspect of colonial shame we are so ashamed of our social evil that we create right. laws that completely subvert justice like for instance somebody is innocent till proved guilty all that is brushed aside same thing happens in the SC Act yeah SC Act same thing happens in the Dowry Act all sensible safeguards of human dignity of real justice are brushed aside anybody can be thrown into jail just just because somebody complained you don't right. have to prove them they are guilty because we want to quickly fix this feeling of shame that we have mm-hmm. that terrible evil custom now if you look back on the history of this you see that dowry is actually a european custom it comes from europe mm-hmm. there is this, this mm-hmm. no word comes from europe that the custom comes from europe you can read medieval europe and even if you read jane austen or something the notion of dowry comes up or other places the the, the notion of dowry comes up it comes up in europe yeah there is a different custom it's actually called stridhan <clears throat> what is stridhan stridhan literally means the wealth of a woman this wealth is passed down from mother to daughter and because it is passed down from mother to daughter it is part of the respect of the woman in the family the woman brings her own wealth when she is joining in alliance with somebody else and this is a mark of, of respect for it. in fact you will notice oftentimes bringing a personal thing in my dad was kind of definitely part of the social revolutionary mindset he himself, you know, we come from a community where where giving during marriage was very common. He was very adamant. He was not going to take anything, and he he refused. Like his father-in-law was quite wealthy, but I I think there's an incident where Petty of uh, Alfonso Mangos is sent, and he returns it saying, "No, I said I'm not going to accept anything. So why are you right. sending anything?" Right. So he he was this fervent campaigner, um, right. and the the problem with that is that. It actually, in some senses, lowers the status of the woman in the household because then mm-hmm. everything is dependent on the man. And then what mm-hmm. happens later is that when he himself is marrying his daughter, though he insists that he's going to, and and what is the phrase that we use in Hindi? Be hamari beti hai, jo hamari marzi hai, wo denge. Right? Right. Now, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Obviously, he's still campaigning against this notion of anybody demanding dowry, which is completely un-Indic. Right, there right. is no issue of anybody demanding dowry. It is right of the receiver. But what is it? It is saying that for my daughter 
I value my daughter, therefore I'm giving all this to her. It is her property. Mm-hmm. And the way to look at it, if you were looking at it in another way as Tridhan, we see this is actually early inheritance. It is the mm-hmm. early inheritance of the daughter, right? Mm-hmm. The sons might inherit stuff later after the parents are gone, but this is an early inheritance that is given to the daughter. And if you look right. at it that way, suddenly becomes very positive. Like, wow, you're giving it because, because she's going and making a home with somebody else. That home is supporting part of it. And, and the parents of the daughter are also supporting the establishment by the home by giving her an early inheritance. Now you give the early inheritance and now you create another set of draconian laws that says inheritance must be equal, you know, for, mm-hmm. for the genders, which is fine. Even our Shastras have this. Now you've taken away the notion of early inheritance. Um, right. And you have no adjustment for that early inheritance, and now you create more conflict in family. Colonialism and decolonization is not some myth out there for an academic study that mm-hmm. say, oh no, no, how does it matter? We are fine. We are not fine. Mm-hmm. We are creating laws. We are creating interventions in society that are really destroying our society, that are very harmful for our society because we do not have the right understanding of our own society and because we are using this gaze to study colonial society. You did not just touch on the aspects of whether uh, colonization only means, you know, uh, English language or uh, the way we dress up or something, but it's more nuanced based on the fact that it's culturally changing us, our habits, our behavior, our our, our society. And that's a huge, huge, uh, you know, turn from where we used to be as Sanatanis to where we are today as uh, Hindus. Right, right. And and the most important aspect to decolonize is to, to remove the filters on our gaze, to, to right. see things as they are, to come closer and closer to reality and to see things as they are and discard this discourse. You know, like the, the standard discourse of the caste system is Brahmins, um, you know, created, invented this caste system to subjugate all the other castes and kept them like this for 5,000 years. Till when? Till yeah. the British saviors came, of course, and, and showed us the <laughs> path to light and Jesus, right? <clears throat> but if you look at that story, I mean, that story is so absurd because it says that my ancestors were stupid and foolish because they were hypnotized by these evil Brahmins for 5,000 years, right? <laughs> So all, all, all the so-called non-Brahmin lower caste people were, were stupid and, right. and, and, and completely incapable of thinking for themselves, completely in, incapable of any military action, right? They were, they were just in hypnosis. They, they, they were in the state of hypnosis for 5,000 years. And this is the standard academic story of caste, right? This oh, is, and, yes. and, and the notion that it is static is, you know, is, is historically inaccurate, that, you know, all these things change. What is caste itself is, is just a concocted word. There is no such thing. There is jati, there is varna. All those people who claim that this comes from the Manusmriti, they should give, they should bring a one simple fact out for me. Can you present me a list of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes that was there before the British? We documented everything, right? I mean, right. We, in all our texts in the Mahabharata, everything, there's so much document. We document flora and fauna and this and this category. We even document the categories of, you know, in the Kama Sutra, we document eight categories of women and eight categories of right. men. And this, you know, we document everything. We categorize everything. Right. Why didn't we make this list of scheduled castes before the British came and gave us this great gift? Then people say, oh, no, no, no. What do you mean British created the caste system? You know, we have discrimination for so many years. This, the question is not whether there is some group that had some discrim, some aspects of how people discriminate against each other in any society. There are many different kinds of social organizations. Some may be oppressive, some may be good. All of that, I am not denying any of the facts of 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 some people oppressed by another people at some point of time, but. What we understand of this overarching caste system hierarchy, which is static for 5,000 years that the Brahmins manipulated us, all this is complete bunkum. It, it makes no rational sense and makes no historical sense if you look at, look at the actual um, episodes and how, how it goes about. So we have, but we, this is a story that is being repeated. It's repeating all over the world. 
that mm. this is this is the caste system and and this is what doing and brahmins are terrible and all of those are non brahmin I, i find it it's like it's you know you you have created this whole narrative of of oppressor uh, for people who are actually a small minority and they they never had great power in the sense that right. you know they didn't have military power they did not have the economic resources you know they had a certain function in society and they were respected for that function it's as simple as that right rather than right. look at that you 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 map kind of european understanding of serfdom and you map your you know like all these things that happened in europe just like in dowry case you map all these concepts of europe which don't apply to india and then you you try to like the if you look at what the census did the risley census the british census they went and they mapped the size of the they had this nasal index the breadth of the nose divided by the length of the nose and all the <laughs> completely absurd racial categorizations that were happening in europe in the end of the 19th century and they used this to map every single person in india based on like saying oh is this uh, you know members of the caste have this nasal index versus this this jati this thing <laughs> I mean, the whole thing is complete absurdity. Like, like, right. where did the where did this? And later on, those theories have all been discarded in Europe themselves. But that is the the theories that 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 underpin this this the so called caste notion. It is something like a, the colon and the colonialism perpetuates today. Its colonialism is not a historic fact. Coloniality is alive and well today through all the instruments of the state. you know whether it's the judiciary whether it's the executive even the legislature the kind of laws that are framed you know the kind and this this is across parties uh, so mm-hmm. we should assume that that because a party has changed the 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 col- colonization has changed because to decolonize the individuals themselves must decolonize and they must come to a right understanding of themselves which is not true across the political spectrum mm uh great uh, job debunking it uh, you know for all of us but if you can briefly also share how do you see it 30 40 50 years going um, indians uh, are going to decolonize uh, themselves but how, what are the steps do you think uh, would it be a top down approach you know only political parties and uh, top leaders can influence it and we uh, uh, educated leaders uh, who understand coloniality um at the top or do you think it can be a bottom up approach as well wherein grassroots level work is needed in order to decolonize ourselves see we have to we have to use our own framework to understand this question you know political leaders are kshatriya varna right hmm. i'm not talking about jati here because right. because when you the, the the our concepts are so kind of mixed up so let's just be very clear right. varna is social theory correct <laughs> Varna is social theory. Varna is like if you are reading a book of sociology, that is what Varna is. It exactly. is not. It is not, and it is not a system of, you know, of um, inheritance by, by by itself. It is not a system that even maps directly to any society because it is social right. theory. Every every society will only approach it in different ways and create understanding of. of that it is meant to create understanding for for well functioning society this is the function of varna if i take your question who is going to create this change the political leadership is a kshatriya varna kshatriya varna is limited it's limited in the sense that they are able to do action on the ground to some extent they are they are they are managing affairs they are the executive but they are not the people who are going to bring right scholarship that is why all the rajas had brahman advisors what is brahman advisors means this the varna there is a function the brahman function is the function which is bringing scholarship that is bringing right understanding that is bringing right education into society and then right. the king abides by that because the king does not really have the time to go into research and figure out all yeah. this stuff yeah. you know just like our political leaders are too busy trying to fight elections this is the the system that is put in place right now get funds for elections go and give speeches to people they don't have the time to do research they don't have the time to understand all of these so all of the varnas have to start functioning in a proper way i right? i am not a code brahmin jati but i have taken on this talk right now is a function of the brahman varna right we are right. we are 
the the work that you are doing you are bringing bringing people on your podcast you are spreading a certain set of ideas this is a function of the brahmin varna we are not going and and you know running the politics of the country we are not doing that we are bringing a set of set of ideas and in that sense of the varna this is why i started <coughs> garuda books now starting of right. an organization of course has elements of the kshatriya varna as well as the vaishya varna because all those are uh, important in terms of you know when you set up a but i started the publishing house and this is in response to your question of why what needs to be done or who will do the change right where right. will it come from to have a platform for a set of ideas to get platformed and showcased so that it, they form a corpus on which we will then build and so we can start this process of decolonization <clears throat> that is the entire aim of starting garuda prakashan or garuda book so what we do is we just like what you are doing in your podcast or you know so people are doing it in many different ways to bring forth a fresh understanding a new understanding first step is to have the people who do the research to to come to that understanding then right. it's a question of dialogue with society and and having this dialogue happen at different levels of society so that that big understanding can then start to perlocate in different levels of society and once that is happening then from there itself the political leadership will arise that will say okay now we need to bring this change into right. society no similar thing happened when i wrote this book the english medium myth when i wrote it in 2014 it was mm. people were laughing at it is like oh this is like a done issue like english has won we shouldn't even talk about this issue like you're you're beating a dead horse you know there's, there's nothing no change is going to happen nobody is going to listen to you and and to a large extent that was also true i talked to everybody in the political leadership up down nobody was listening right and of course all of the elite had already bought into the idea that english is the only way forward and you can't right. do it <clears throat> but then i started giving these talks i went to all of the iits i gave the talk i brought my own experience into play and slowly slowly in fact even i remember iit kanpur which is my own alma mater i was there and and right. when i gave the talk professors came to me later saying that when they had started listening to the talk they had one view of language and by the time they had finished the talk they were actually in agreement uh, with the fact that we need to bring indian languages into the, into play for for education and they see the difficulties that their students have faced so change happened and slowly slowly as more awareness rose different people started to to you know appreciate those ideas now in the new in the last couple of years the government has started initiatives and now they are publicly saying we are going to teach engineering we are going to take medicine in indian languages it's not that the work is done the work is just beginning right is seed of it but it gives us a one template of how decolonization and how change can happen in society mm-hmm. you know and there are people like i don't know if you came across word of rajiv dikshit Uh, you know who was uh, who was um, speaking a lot on on these issues in 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 hindi and on youtube channels right. and, and you went to different villages gave the talk i remember i was driving um on um, highway from gurgaon to uh delhi in a in a taxi and my taxi driver slowed down another taxi driver came and they threw a tape from one taxi to the other taxi and then i was like what is this tape about he's like no no it's rajiv dikshit we we've, we've been sharing his his talks you know and <laughs> and they put that tape in the tape recorder and then i was like oh play it for me it's like so many different ways that the society organically perlocates these ideas but that is mm-hmm. why the work you are doing um, is so important because we need to bring these fresh ideas into into circulation and 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 society as it starts to understand that then we'll start to question why are we following this british system it is not serving right. us the judiciary is not serving us the admin the ias system is not serving us right, right. It, all these systems are keeping us in servitude so we really mm-hmm. need to get to right education you know the education system is the biggest biggest factor for colonization today that is what is colonizing our minds repeatedly every pretty much every single line that is in our textbook is 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 coming from the colonial mindset changing of that changing of people changing of the mind and then it will i i think the change has to begin i mean it it's it change happens in both directions but but you cannot have top down change till there is grassroots change there has to be a tipping point of understanding because the 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 powers that be will never act if they think they are going to be perceived as acting radically 
uh, because mm-hmm. they, they don't want to upset the apple cart but when more and more people like in the language can more and more people start demanding it asking for it that change is going to happen from the top of i get the gist of uh, you know how that change can happen it cannot be by one person it cannot be one political party it has to be a unanimous uh, and a long process when in the current scenario when no major leaders are talking about hindu civilization like modi and others are they are more interested in you know growth and uh, whether our uh, economy can go to a 5 trillion dollar economy soon and how india appears outside uh, to the world like strong and uh, growing and prosperous then how come we be able to protect our hindu civilization is it then just left on to some people i mean why i say some people is because even though we are 110 crores you know hindus but we are still not all the 110 crores are not the flag bearers of hindu civilization as you know you know most of hindus are now macaulay indians they go outside india as soon as they get an opportunity i mean i am a culprit of it as well but that was more because i was trying to find career and uh, trying to find the right uh, mix for myself but how do you think that then we can protect uh, and grow the hindu civilization because right now nobody is talking about it it just looks like some youtube channels uh, people like yourself who are doing a lot uh, in terms of writing these books and educating people and all but other than that the real tsunami of that change is still not happening so how do you see it first way to look at it is that we don't have to protect or preserve something we mm. can go forward with much more confidence than that the right. entire world is actually coming to hindu wisdom you know if you look at how the yoga movement is spreading if you look at how the discourses are happening what kind of questions are being grappled with <clears throat> i was talking to my my daughter who works in san francisco she had an interesting experience she did a kind of a summer camp in india where she had gone around with this kind of social group on talking to different people of society in villages and other things and the the people in the the her co participants in the camp were all 20 something uh, indians and she was surprised at how out of touch they were with their own culture he saying everybody in san francisco is talking about you know i'm going to my yoga class and i'm doing this mantra chanting and i'm doing this kirtan and oh right. you know all the people that she's hanging out in, in in san francisco who were like you know people from american people they are that's what they were they were interested in whereas the the the, the youngsters she was talking about in india seem to have no clue about all of these what is sanatan will never perish so mm-hmm. so one of the things we we need to walk with this confidence that what is sanatan will never perish at right. the same time that doesn't mean that we have don't have a responsibility to act because we understand something it is our responsibility to take action to to bring right knowledge to the world to spread the right action that will again happen in a, in a in a mix of in a mix of ways i actually don't care about the government doing anything i just wanted to get out of the way the government of india right. right now is a colonial state that continues to impose mm. draconian laws on hindus robs them of their of their wealth robs the temples mm. of their wealth you know constantly creates schemes which categorize people based on religion and discriminates mm. um, against people based on religion you all these schemes are available to the from the government of india only if you declare yourself to not be hindu you know mm-hmm. it's a complete i've 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 covered it in an article called india as a constitutional apartheid state it's a religious apartheid state <clears throat> where your prime minister when he says a minority of people have the first right on resources what does that mean what kind of state would as a minority of people have more rights than a majority right. like like south africa an apartheid state where a small elite white minority has the first right on resources versus the majority of people this is an absurd statement to make in right. a country but this is a statement that a, the that a prime minister proudly makes that the minority has the first right on resources when you look at that my real goal is firstly from a civilizational point of view we have to see that economic you know again if you go back to the varma all four varnas are linked you do not have you cannot you cannot just have economic confidence and success without also having intellectual uh, confidence and success without also having 
the military might you know if you look at the rise of america you know you, right. there is a military might there is a kshatriya varna you have the the intellectual might of their academia and their propaganda and the media you know and all of all of the functions of that similarly china is taking the chapter of the same book china is mm-hmm. developing its military might china itself as it's go if you go to china you go to the museum i think this was in xian probably i was in xian and i was okay. there was a museum and i was looking at I'm trying to remember it was zinc plating or some something they were they were describing in the museum and they said europe claims that they invented this in so and so date but of course <laughs> we had this several hundred years earlier china is very cognizant of this is very cognizant right. of the fact that it needs to counter the intellectual challenge of the west it is funding confucius institutes all over the world it's it's giving scholarships for people to learn mandarin all over the world it's got a very clear aim to establish mandarin as a world language which is happening if you go to a high school in america you will get mandarin as one of the choices in in high schools in america so if you look at hollywood uh, china is actually influencing hollywood to produce you know you have this movie called uh, what chang li or something that came out yeah uh, you know right so and if you'll notice even a lot of the disney stuff some of them will be using mandarin a lot of them will be like looking at chinese culture as you know from 50 years ago movies where they're looking at like low stereotype culture here right. they're, they're looking at chinese culture as high culture right mm. <clears throat> and so there's all the shift happening it's not happening by accident this is this is happening as part of the narrative building that china understands very very well and if you look at even you know the marvel universe or or, or disney as one microcosm um <clears throat> you're very influential microcosm in terms of you know pop culture what i'm saying is that that indian culture has been relegated uh, relegated to bollywood and this is really a problem not of the west it's a problem of deracinated indians deracinated hindus Correct. not having a clue even when they go to the west they don't have a clue and we've taken the whole <clears throat> set of ideas of <clears throat> meditation of you know mindfulness of all of those things you know which happen you know if you go to do- look at doctor strange or all right. of these other other movies you know that right. where they where they're talking about those facets chakras all of those things presented in a you know like the hindu framework is is it's the all of the hindu ideas but they right. have presented in a non indic non hindu you know system they they are represented by by chinese characters or you know characters from other cultures not from from characters from india the but the ideas are powerful the ideas are perlocating right the mm-hmm. ideas of the rishis of all those they are so powerful that despite you being literally having a colonial anti hindu system in india that is right. that is completely against the hindu civilization despite mm-hmm. all of these you know forces that are arranged against it still those ideas have so much power that they are that they are that they are spreading in the world that they are taking over the world right because they come from a deeper state of awareness from a deeper state of consciousness from the perception and the direct drishti or you know mm-hmm. darshan of of our mm-hmm. rishis they and those ideas have so much strength and power that they spread not because there is money backing it not because there is military power backing it because that the reality is aligned to those ideas so more you invest in reality you are bound to come back to those set of set of ideas when we talk about uh the civilization war i think at least i believe it uh, like that that uh, we are facing a civilization war uh with islam that has uh, been waged on bharat for almost 1400 years now uh we seek the solutions for it as to how we can overturn it because even today we are struggling uh with it uh, even though they are a so called minority of 15 to 18% um our brave leaders like maharana pratap shivaji and more had shown great resistance but somehow you know because of disintegrated states and uh and uh, for their own vested interest we had given up uh, Uh, against uh, the turkish the islamic invaders the portuguese the britishers so we have a great example of spain you know, who had uprooted islam uh, which is also called the spain's reconquista uh, how do you think india can do it i mean not finding a step by step solution but very macro level uh, is it only by winning 
the narrative war that uh, you know somehow you, you know youtubers and authors and uh, uh, scholars uh, from the right wing have started or do you think we need uh, to first acknowledge in india that uh, we are facing this war i think there is a there is a lot of um, talk about islam in 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 um, recent uh, times and i have also tweeted about it and i don't want right. to minimize it but i would actually challenge us to say that we are and i have also written about the christian conversion war for about 20 right. years there's an article on the, on the christian conversion but i would challenge us to say that we are more than being converted by islam or christianity today we are converted by modernity and secularism we have actually internalized um as a, as a mass of people we have internalized the narrative of the west as a superior narrative whether that be in medicine whether that be in science whether that's be in ethical thinking whether that be you know in a, in a whole set of uh, fields whether that be in social science whether that be in economics we are converted through english and science more than we are through islam and christianity so and this is this is a in some ways a radical statement so let me explain what i mean by that see we have to go back to the what is the structure and view or experience that the indian civilization has has brought and this is that all of the hindu civilization was geared towards the raising of consciousness right. all of our art forms all of our academic forms you know you take music you take dance you take sculpture um, you take uh, you know mathematics uh, there's a new book from garuda coming out on hindu mathematics and it's showing how the invention of mathematics in india including the invention of zero and the decimal system was closely linked to the philosophical systems of hindu thought right. my uh, what i'm saying is that you know all of academia today that is being taught in india you know what is taught in sociology what is taught in political science what is taught in history a whole bunch of these is equally a part of that conversion as much as islam and christianity are islam and christianity seem more visible and in our face to us <clears throat> but if we do not really decolonize and um, mm. and are converted in the other sense i think the damage is equally great um then it is just by conversion through the sword or something else that is happening you know from islam and christianity right um from an indian perspective two things need to happen one is that the state needs to change from what it is today which is a explicitly anti hindu state because you cannot have the state i mean literally you have the two most powerful as religious groupings the two most powerful and dominant religious groupings of the world are christianity and islam <clears throat> right mm. they have billions and billions of dollars at their disposal mm. you know tens of countries will stand up you know we just saw what happened you know some mm. somebody write something about their profit right. tens of countries are going to spend through diplomatic channels and all of this <clears throat> how many countries are going to stand up if something somebody writes something against hindus right or against jain <laughs> right right so what you have is you have a global power ecosystem there are so many countries in europe that fund the church that fund ngos that are associated with the church you know all this lot of state power is channeled into both these religions across the world mm -hmm. so on the one hand you've got two globally dominant highly resources highly motivated religious groupings that are on a conversion war for heathens and on the other hand the indian state instead of representing its civilization is also part of that same grouping it right. also claims to fund the same religious groups that are world dominant <laughs> that are the right. most wealthy and it funds them in the name of minority minorities right. in india right? right i mean this is the biggest absurdity on the planet no other country is funding court religion to subvert the majority religion it would right. be absurd nobody is doing it but somehow we've been conned into it across the board across the political spectrum this is not based <laughs> on a party or anything like that the right. so called right wing hindu party whatever you want to call it i don't identify with any of those labels but also does the same thing does it even more than than the other side so because we have internalized these colonial ideas mm. we've internalized these ideas that this is the this is what means to be secular 
this is what it of course minorities should have special rights this is you know you talk to um, um, somebody in the bjp and you argue with them they'll say the same thing yes 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 of course you know we have to take care of the these you know people otherwise they lag behind and all of this so, so the same story the same narrative is re- repeated on both sides so we have to first of all have a state which is not being counter to the civilization i'm not even mm-hmm. it's a far cry for it to actually start supporting the civilization but right now it is absolutely opposed to the civilization and secondly once you have that then be committed to leading people to awakening there is no other solution do kashmiri muslims really know the their real history what happened to them what happened to their ancestors what was done to them how they came to the state has anybody engaged with them in recent times on the philosophical ideas without the state actually turning them over to the wolves or arresting them or right. or we want the state to create a level playing field rest we will be able to do because the our ideas and our understanding is so powerful of the rishi that mm. all of these ideas will 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 perish in front of but the, the, this has never been a war of ideas it's been a war of sword and resources and money power and and muscle power and all of these things combined mm. and now because this narrative has been internalized about what what you the state should be doing and how it should be acting that that narrative itself is become a big burden on on us as 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 hindus you know and people who are taking but but the flip of that is that the hindus first have to start with decolonizing themselves they can't decolonize somebody who's been captured by islam when your own mind you don't know anything about your tradition you have you don't do sadhana you don't you know you 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 have not connected deeply with the tradition and a practice right it's, mm-hmm. it's just become an idea in your head if it's just an idea in your head you're not going to have the power of understanding and clarity to be mm-hmm. able to to talk to the other person either you're going to say silly things like oh we are all the same how does it matter <laughs> you know all the stuff you're going to say because you have no clue you don't understand yourself and you have not studied the other right so either you'll say silly things like that or you'll think that doing some fir or arresting somebody because they insulted your god or something like that is going to solve any problem you know none of it is going to do anything it's not going to change right. a single thing so both sides reaction of the hindu community is is very limited in the kind of change that we need to happen and the change will only can only happen of course we need again all four varnas are very important in any change right. any transformation right so we need the intellectual capability if if there is a sword at the neck you know you cannot you cannot just deal with intellectual capability you need to develop self defense so that you're able to counter that sword on the neck you need to deploy the money power because a lot of like right. because of the church stuff is all coming through huge amounts of money power right yeah. so many us state funds are channeled through christian organizations that end up one way or the other in the conversion war mm-hmm. you know so billions and billions of dollars of resources are are deployed so you need to create that that uh, that that vaishya varna power um, right. and that that's uh, you know i started garuda books garuda books still needs a lot of support you know so it's one of those things where people say okay like how can we come how can we take an initiative because the brahman varna will need the support support of the vaishya varna it cannot succeed on its own right this is how the society is designed so somebody is doing work in their intellectual endeavor then the then the business community has to come forth and saying yes i'm going to support this i'm going to fund this we started in garuda we started this thing called garuda club where you can sign up and you we send you our best book every month you know so if we if we get few thousand people on that you know all of these things i'm giving you examples saying that all of those varna have to come into play uh um, mm-hmm. similarly the shudra varna what does shudra varna mean mm-hmm. shudra varna is, is simply people who i act as a shudra varna when i am and when i'm retweeting something you know right. or when i'm right. when i'm propagating an idea it doesn't have to be my own idea it right. doesn't have, but i can still act as a as in service uh, right shudra varna is a varna is saying what seva can i do what service can i do <clears throat> i don't have to be the the smartest person who's thought of this idea right there are many other smart people i don't have to be the most moneyed people who can fund all of this i don't have to have the physical strength myself but still i can take vivek dahiya shows and i can subscribe to the channel i can mm-hmm. send it on whatsapp that's 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 something that somebody can do right so 
so all of those functions will need to be activated and be aware of it and as we are aware of it then the the only solution is firstly the state has to to become at least neutral and then there is a serious effort to winning back the people who have left the fold and winning them back through a set of ideas but again all functions have to be put into play whether it's it's work it's it's uh, money power whether you know i was talking to <clears throat> esther danraj and you know one of the thing and her she documents her story of being converted because somebody came to her family and her family was in financial trouble and right. they they offered money and so the family converted and of course hindus now deride these people as rice bag converts right but the problem mm-hmm. is why aren't hindus giving rice bags what's the problem <laughs> with you right? right if somebody can convert somebody on the on the basis of a rice bag where is your economic power that is able to also give a rice bag and say no you don't need to go right we mm-hmm. were going to take care of you economically we were going to help you mm-hmm. you know right mm-hmm. and the same thing can be used to bring those people back because a lot of the people even today in india of course there's a lot you know they they get indoctrinated every week from the church and from the mosque right. and you know the all this thing because falsehood requires repeated indoctrination truth mm. can stand on its own it doesn't need mm. it doesn't even need repetition once once you understand the truth you are you understand the truth but because you have to take something away from what is natural mm. when you when you have to take somebody away from their nature then you have to keep stuffing it into their head because otherwise they're going to stray what is mm. saying mean they will go to shark the natural culture of humans is is paganism right yes so they they that is what is derided because that is what is natural to human beings and therefore that has to be exterminated through repeated indoctrination through sunday school through through the mosque sermons even if you were let even if you were to let the people be for a small period of time they are going to revert back because mm. this is what is natural this is the dharma right. is built into the structure of the universe we are not right. teaching anything from the outside we are just saying look at observe reality this is how reality right. is you know right. every every creature has dharma and reality every creature is related to everything else every mm. creature craves for happiness you know sarve bhavantu sukhina you know yeah. so ev- this is this is inherent to the fabric of the of the universe sanatan dharma is not trying to indoctrinate you into a set of beliefs it's just saying see what is real and be in touch with real what is real and learn how to be happy mm-hmm. what is taking you away from happiness other sects uh follow the uh, paths that you know there is only one god while in hindu dharma we call that everything around us has god in it right. and that's the basic difference um how beautifully uh you put it so, yeah it's like you know like sometimes i have a debate with an atheist to say okay you no know, prove that god exists as like i there's nothing to prove from from ashtavakra gita right. says everything that exists is brahman right. right everything that exists is brahman now what is the question of what am i going to prove that exists or not exists i've defined brahman as everything that exists <laughs> end of story <laughs> right right, right? Okay. you only have to these questions because you have this imaginary transcendent god who's sitting in the sky somewhere and he's you know having these scales he's judging human beings and you know and he say there are thrones they have defined a throne sitting on right. the ground okay can i see it through the telescope where is this throne you know i am also an atheist i am a christian atheist and i am an islamic atheist <laughs> that's well said <laughs> but it, because because those concepts i have served they don't make any sense to me right right India in the field of AI and uh, you know filing patents is far behind than China at this moment uh, and also about the number of unicorns uh, you you have also touched about that in some of your talks that there are in India as compared to China there are less unicorns uh, why do you think this is happening do you think that we can attribute this to our uh, again the the education system which is colonial like you mentioned in one of your talks that you know you went to khadodra uh, village in haryana and 90% of uh, the the kids there actually did not know english but they were very good in mathematics so my point is 
is our education system sort of limiting us in reaching to that point where we are innovating less where we are not creating more visionaries and intelligent people compared to others uh, so what's your what's your view on that uh, is it is it because of english that is limiting us or is it our education system yeah i think i think there's a combination of this one of the things yeah. that uh, has happened is obviously when you have an education system that just really exists in english especially at the higher levels and only i would say 10% of the people of india know english to any degree of fluency you know some people might know a pattern smattering of words here and there but to able to completely express themselves in english i'd be even surprised that if it's even Correct. even 10% right? right if you look at how how can you know this if you look at for instance newspapers out of the top 10 newspapers even today despite pushing so much english of the top 10 newspapers only one is an english language newspaper in india all the rest of <laughs> the indian language newspapers in circulation right. even today if you look at um television channels it's even it's even much more a much smaller percentage of uh, indians will listen to uh, television in english versus uh, television in their own language <clears throat> which means that if they have an option if they have an option and not something which is imposed by the government people all over the world including in india prefer to read and to hear in their own language so now the the argument that is made is no 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 people want english the government is trying to support indian languages but it's the people that want english it's not true people don't want right. english they want jobs what the government has done is it has forced you that if you want to do an mba you can only do it in english <clears throat> if you want to do engineering you can only do it in if you want to become a doctor you can only do it in english if you want to become a uh, you know ca you can only study in english for the most part so the government has forced all, it funds all these institutions it funds iims it funds iits it funds all these institutions which are only english right so the government has taken away all the options for indian language learners to rise and, the, and then they say no 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 it's the people who are demanding english therefore this is happening so oh, it's not the people that are demanding english whenever they have a choice to listen to content in their own language <clears throat> so that's the first thing to 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 realize <clears throat> the second thing is that china firstly is not only uh, created its entire education system in uh, chinese <clears throat> in its own language all the way to the phd level in fact it's even recently it's even made english testing illegal in beijing <clears throat> you cannot even use english as a criteria for promotion in school or or uh, have any mandatory english testing this is the extent of uh, what they are doing at till the phd level in computer science and all of that i was talking to some software programmers in microsoft who came from china and they they still use the chinese version of the software development kit manual to to do do their programming so they will study from that to figure out what to do all of it is happens in their own language so what that means is that instead india is acting as a country with less than 10% of its population and talent right because you've only geared the whole education system to this very very small percentage of people right mm -hmm. so you're actually discarding 90 plus percent of the talent including the talent in villages that i document in my book mm -hmm. the english medium myth where 33% of the children in that one village are tested at iq in the 90th 90th percentile you know mm. which which you know if if we go by the norm it should only have been 10% so but when i talked to the principal and said uh, you know these children are so bright they must go into you know uh, must do really well or this thing ji 8th ke baad drop out ho jata hai bachcha yahan ka kyunki aage ke padhai sari angrezi mein mera english yeah ganit mein bada tez hai lekin usko angrezi nahi samajh aati my child is very good in math we invented math we invented pretty much all of the math that is the basis of the math that is being studied today the binary system that is used in computer all of that came from. rather than building on those strengths and rather than realizing that india actually did well in computers because we had a history of mathematics in our culture we said no 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 we are actually doing well in computer because of english <laughs> well if that's true why is nigeria not an it power israel you know nigeria right. also uses english why nigeria yes. it should be an it power not israel and china and russia we are importing mm -hmm. arms from france we are importing arms from all the high tech stuff we are getting from russia and france and israel for our defense needs which are all developed for using french and 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 right. and russian and and hebrew <clears throat> but then we are saying no no english advantage we have english advantage so <laughs> where exactly is this advantage i have not been able to find any evidence of this advantage but we right. keep repeating it mindlessly like 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 
like fools mm. <laughs> and coming back to patents so china in india you cannot even file a patent in any indian language patent office doesn't oh. even accept it it is only acceptable in english fact of the matter is you cannot have creativity flourish in a foreign language creativity come you know you you dream of ideas you dream of thoughts you, you don't dream in a foreign language how many people are dreaming in in english in india right mm-hmm. very small percentage <clears throat> so you cannot dream you cannot invent you cannot create and then you cannot express that in your own language because you're not even allowed to file a patent in mm. in that so china has has done that and then china has got a singular focus on the cultivation of excellence and of talent where india has internalized these caricatures of things called social justice and all of these things mm. again imported ideas makes makes no sense whatsoever you know in how they are being applied to india and there's no metrics there is no metrics to measure when the social justice will be achieved there is no there is no system in place but it's become a political imperative that you have to keep doing this which is hmm. you constantly sacrifice excellence you you cannot now you say in iit you cannot even hire the best teachers because they must be determined by quotas on what right. kind of professors you must what china did it created a thousand talent program where hmm. it recruited the best academic talent from across the world gave them huge incentives to come back to china to teach their students this is how excellence is created you right. you reward excellence china could have lots of uh, opportunity for court social justice and it's very oppressive in many ways to non right. han chinese to tibetans to uyghurs to so many people i am not saying you emulate the china model and start being oppressive like but hmm. at the same time you have to recognize what are they doing in sport they yes. are saying we are going to cultivate excellence from a very young period we are going to invest in this we are going to mm. cultivate excellence in computer science they are going to get the best talent we are going to cultivate excellence in science they have long term 20 30 year thinking 40 year thinking to say okay how do we cultivate excellence in these fields by recognizing and rewarding the best talent from all across the world this is how america flourished america right. flourished because it created a system where the best talent would want to come and work in america does the best, mm. best talent want to come to work in india even the talent that wants to come and work in india is completely hobbled by the system we've created of quota exactly. and that and restrictions and you can't do this and you have to retire at this age you know people professors who are on the prime in the in the western universities they'd be teaching for 20 more years here you retire them why do we not have a single minded focus on excellence only then mm. we'll be able to create talent and then be able to create patterns that are challenging the world how many apps for all the software superpower english advantage how many applications from india have taken over the world how many how many software companies from india have developed products that the entire world is using Al- almost none we are just doing none. you know uh, uh, labor for other people right we are mm. we are not we are not creating innovations ourselves they are not india based companies that are coming out and and revolutionizing the world so right. because we have this limited thinking very limited approach to how we are going about it and we think english is going to uh, to save us rather english is the language of our backwardness because Correct. we are we are destroying 90% of the talent of the country and not even letting it rise or given an opportunity fantastic great point i mean now uh, we can dig as much as possible into this and that's why i would uh, uh, you know definitely buy uh, uh, your book uh, sankrant and i would also urge viewers who would be watching this podcast to also by uh, sankran's book is it's an amazing book i've read the excerpt of it and it covers what you're talking about fantastic fantastic thing because unless we do not understand you know what's wrong with us we cannot mend it uh, right now we we don't even know what's wrong with us i mean imagine just 6 months ago i didn't even know what coloniality means sankran <laughs> to be honest with you Absolutely. and now yeah yeah now i'm trying to educate people and try to educate myself about it Absolutely, and I think that journey we've all been through. Like, I went myself went through English medium schooling in India. Right. I myself thought English is the way for progress. All these ideas, but it's only when you know I've now been to over fifty countries, and I actually went right. and I studied these different countries and looked at that and see how people are using language. And of course, in Europe, it's easier because you you know it's so easy to to just go and see everybody's using their own language. <laughs> you Correct. know, it's like. all through the schooling system everywhere people are using their own language but still we are keeping on repeating this this thing about English. same mistake right <laughs> yeah great uh so one of the topics that i also want to talk to you about was about consciousness you mentioned about consciousness of the atheist 
versus the consciousness of the believers is consciousness emergent phenomena um, of matter like the atheists believe or is it con- or consciousness is a substratum like you mentioned well <clears throat> i wouldn't even i might have used the term believer <clears throat> maybe right. half in, in jest because right from the hindu point of view we don't need a belief system <clears throat> we are we are scientists of reality right. all of our rishis are scientists of reality so the right. fundamental question for us is the question what is real and this is for instance you know the movie matrix is is trying to explore this question it's a very indic question that we have constantly asked, you know ashtavakra gita begins with that you know yoga vishishta goes into that and constantly interrogates this question about what is reality you know i i was having this dream you know in the in the ashtavakra is i was having this dream and this happened and the, i was hungry and this bird came and took away my food and i just woke up and now i'm sitting in this this court and but but maybe i'm still dreaming like how do i know that what i'm doing here is dreaming or whether that dream was real or this is real so this question repeatedly comes up in the hindu tradition on why is this because so there's only two or three central questions i actually gave a talk on this topic what are the central questions that interest us right the, the what god exists is kind of a stupid question it's not even our question that that comes from right. this western you know paradigm because they create, first you fabricate this god then you wonder whether it exists but for us the interesting question is what is reality what is reality then how do i refine my perception more and more so i can see reality as it is rather than through all the filters that mm-hmm. that i get and colonialism is one filter but there's so many filters every human being has all these filters and emotional things and and concepts in their head that are uh, not allowing us to see reality as it is so what is reality the second is this cultivation of awareness cultivation of consciousness to perceive this reality as it is and the third question is how can i be happy this is a striving of every living being you know every living being goes towards ha- towards happiness even a dog will find a comfortable resting spot in the house and curl curl themselves up so that it can be comfortable and happy so every living being is striving towards happiness nobody wants to strive towards discomfort uh, or or unhappiness <clears throat> so then the question uh, the hindu tradition asks us how can i be happy and then i say okay is pleasure happiness is it the same thing then we bring on the question of shreyas and prayas there are some things that give us pleasure for a short time but lead to have unhappiness long term and there are other things that make us happy for a greater duration or give give a more consistent state of happiness those are all the central questions and this is where the consciousness <clears throat> issue comes in as well now the materialistic western view or atheistic view in some senses is that consciousness is a property of matter matter becomes sufficiently complex and then it becomes conscious after su- sufficient complexity comes in right this is the standard narrative it was all a cosmic soup and it evolution happened and slowly slowly and then finally it became conscious right something happened it became conscious so consciousness is a property that emerges after complexity happens in the system now the question is what is the evidence for this what is the evidence mm-hmm. that if this is true then you should be able to do a laboratory experiment where you keep you have a soup of chemicals and you keep rotating it at a Um, high enough velocity and suddenly that soup become conscious you know right why are we not able to replicate this theory of of consciousness emerging from complexity of matter in a lab yes. right because it's a it's, it's a doctrine it's an ideology it's not based on reality right. what is the opposite theory the opposite theory is that consciousness is a property of the universe consciousness exists right. Co- consciousness is inherent in the universe and this right. is in fact through that is why evolution happened because evolution is anti entropic right mm. by the law okay. of entropy mm. things should be going to more and more chaos why how does evolution play and and sometimes they say no no that's because entropy can only uh, happen in a closed system but this is an open system but yeah you take the entire universe as a closed system universe going towards great lesser entropy rather than mm. greater entropy which is which is what it should have it goes towards lesser entropy because consciousness is the substratum of the universe conscious force is what and this doesn't require the god concept in the sense of what the abrahamic god concept it is a different notion from the abrahamic god assigning people to heaven hell buckets they don't have to go into any of that stuff right what we say is 
right now is there consciousness existing right now are you conscious right we can mm-hmm. start from you okay if you are conscious that means consciousness exists right now now if consciousness exists right now it means consciousness is a property of the universe at this moment of time so if right. consciousness is a property of the moment of time the only question is mm-hmm. does matter emerge from consciousness or does consciousness emerge from matter consciousness emerging from matter there is no experiment that i have seen or there right. is no evidence that this this is true that consciousness emerges from matter matter, matter emerges correct. from consciousness yes it happens all the time even our dream we have consciousness and we create worlds we create a perception of matter whether or not it's matter <clears throat> we mm. don't even know whether matter exists but i know a perception of matter can exist even in my dream consciousness constantly can create a perception of matter there is evidence for it. from our own experience right. there is pratyaksha praman that i have an i have a experience of matter and why do i have an experience of matter because i am conscious both consciousness exists and my perception and experience of of materiality exists right, right. So that means consciousness constantly and always can create this perception of matter right. so so between the two uh, the scientific mind would come to the conclusion that consciousness is the primary and matter is created as a perception of it right and then of course we can this is just just a very preliminary thing and this is where True. the debate can start you know again going back to what is real coming back to that question you know mm. if i perceive matter is that really matter you know even you know, even mm-hmm. physics is telling us you know what i'm perceiving it looks like i'm this what's all these, yes. these rays of light that are bouncing and falling on my retina and what solid is not really solid then you can start to ask interesting questions rather mm. than stupid questions like you know does god exist and and you Correct. know yes this cosmic soup all this happened you know all this stuff without actually right. having the direct experience of reality <clears throat> fantastic point because w- what you're trying to say is is reality real and how would you know that and who knows so, it? yeah exactly right <laughs> and how can you how can you actually prove it uh with certainty you know even physics cannot today yes. that reality is real how is it that we are so sure that we are not uh sitting here at this moment but we are somewhere else while our consciousness is here and again the, mo- the most interesting thing is that you know when we we come back when we talk about hindu civilization we talk about the right. hindu darshan we come back to the fundamental questions of all human beings we are not inventing some prophet we are not saying okay this person came they gave us a book now you're supposed to follow god's commands all right. this is this is very uninteresting things frankly right. right what we are saying is i am a human being i see my my wife is upset is it is she upset because i said something maybe i dreamed it up maybe maybe i'm projecting that she's upset maybe she's really upset and and she perceives something i said as something different from what i said you know right. all these things are happening right now in my relationship in my experience of the world right we're all constantly sorting through what is real what is did i really feel it did she really feel it did i say what she thought i said maybe she's upset at what she thought i said but i didn't really say it i meant something else and she saw it as something else right this is this is the material of our lives then i say okay how do i cultivate greater awareness so i'm just not reacting i'm just not being an automaton of this reaction mm-hmm. of this chemical reaction that's happening in my mind then i say okay how can i be happy these are the interesting questions these are the fundamental questions of us as human beings and those are really the the central questions of i am very fortunate to use the word my tradition but yes it's really a human tradition it's it's a wealth of the entire world and this right. is why the 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 hindu civilization and hindu tradition is important what a tragedy uh, sankran that a totalitarian kind of abrahamic religions who who believes in totalitarian who preaches totalitarian are something that are evolving in the last 2000 years and a perfectly scientific method of living which is hinduism has been suppressed not just in india but globally mm. and even with uh, you know i mean some scientists like carl sagan and others could actually understand it but they, these are just like uh, anomalies i mean these are these are just a few people who would talk about it who would even think about it Uh, but most of the scientists and atheists and you know these um, believers of totalitarian sects they would always discard hinduism without even understanding what is there i mean 
like in one of your talks you've mentioned about the fact that they talk about 6000 year old uh, world while we are talking about the 1 trillion y- years of uh, existence yes yes but you know i i have a like if you sure. look at it from a broader perspective <clears throat> all these forces have always been there you know when when we talk about asuric forces Asuric, you know, yes. in, in, in our texts, so, you know, people who are doing with one of the yagya that is happening and the right. demons come and they destroy the right. yagya and they, they carry away women and all of this. This has been happening. It doesn't happen now. It's been happening right. all throughout. In a way, there's always the interplay of the of the negative forces and the positive forces. Positive. And that's part of a cosmic cycle. When we look at it in that perspective, Firstly, we go forward with this complete certainty that dharma is eternal and sanatan is eternal. So in, in in some senses it can never perish because this is the reality of the universe. Right? You can right. you can only you can only suppress it for some time, but people will discover it as they are doing now. I mean, why True. why are so many people in the West turning to yoga? <clears throat> why are so many people doing kirtan here and why are they you know like all of the medit now they're calling it they they repackage it into mindfulness and meditation is now getting popular so many different aspects ayurveda is getting is starting to pick up natural medicine they might call it you know something else all of that it's it's cyclical all this happens it is it may be and this is some another uh, idea i'm developing which is it's possible that the totalitarian ideas became popular in a dark age of Kali, <clears throat> in some some parts of the Kali Yoga. And as you see, over the last hundred years, human beings have actually moved towards greater freedom, uh, right. <clears throat> despite the fact, and despite the fact that these totalitarian forces seem very powerful, mm-hmm. they're actually very vulnerable. Because mm-hmm. whenever the youngsters are get out of indoctrination a little bit and I talk in the US and meet a lot of youngsters I've talked to a lot of people who've left the church to ex-Christians and also the young generation is like yeah my parents like go to church or used to go to church and like I find it's all BS you know so there's a lot of awakening happening where people are questioning those ideas they're discarding those ideas and I think in the Islamic world too also the awakening is happening mm-hmm. right now it's just true. suppressed by force well, because you know de- there's death if you're an ex-Muslim, you, your your punishment is death. So you only have to create punishments like that if you are afraid that somebody might the truth might leak out, right? Right. <clears throat> only falsehood needs to create punishment that if you stop believing in it, you're going to be punished by death. I mean the, the mm-hmm. truth is is there if you believe in it is still whether you believe in it or you don't believe in it, it still remains the truth, right? Correct. Your belief or disbelief does not alter it in any. Yeah. Right, but but when when it's a falsehood, then it's very insecure. Keep constantly reinforcing itself, constantly keep pushing itself. So, I think my my two messages there would be: go forth with confidence as, as a Hindu. Go forth with confidence, knowing that yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata. You know, right. the, the 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 divine energy is constantly descending, and we are part of the avatar. We are descending right. that energy. But to be that, we have to be hollow and empty. We have to do our own practice. We have to do our own sadhana, right? I teach this um, program of the art of living uh, Mm -hmm. called Sudarshan Kriya and and Happiness Workshop. And, you know, pick whatever that, you know, I've benefited a lot from that. I recommend it to people, but pick whatever works for you. Pick pick from the tradition, pick a sadhana from the tradition, do it daily, have it before. Because you cannot actually understand our tradition unless you have practice. Um, right. Without practice, uh, you cannot incorporate it. So, I would say, go forth with confidence, but also incorporate practice, sadhana, ritual into life. Whether it is puja, whether it is kirtan, whether it is satsang, whether it is it is kriya. With that is how you can be reflecting that light that needs to mm-hmm. to descend onto the planet. And and I see that the consciousness is actually rising. So I'm not mm-hmm. worried about the totalitarian uh, religions because even though they have money and muscle power and a lot of yeah. noise making power, ultimately the foundation itself is false. You can only build uh, so much of a building on a foundation that doesn't even exist on reality. Do you think that the that the intelligence in humans or our rising in consciousness is because of language? If yes, 
then how come our rishis and munis you know in ancient india could have achieved higher levels of consciousness without knowing more than one language no i don't think uh, consciousness is related to knowing multiple languages or uh, or knowing a lot of language in fact from right. our tradition we say that the maximum knowledge is actually obtained through silence there is this uh, you know para and apara vidya uh, right. and some apara vidya mundane knowledge can be obtained you know through this textual understanding or through lang- linguistic understanding but for <clears throat> para vidya you finally have to go to silence um, which is beyond language definitely consciousness as once we recognize as consciousness is a property of the universe and i am part i am in that ocean of consciousness of which i am a part right, <clears throat> right. and then i i refine through silence i can refine my ability to perceive and be in touch with that ocean of consciousness and when i am in touch with that then i can download knowledge this is you know this is the the matrix kind of depicts it in a interesting way you know where you you jack in and then you you get this like new program downloaded and you download all this knowledge right. but that's in a way that's how it happens that's how our rishis were able to see so many subtle mm-hmm. things about the universe about the human body or all of this because this all of this knowledge exists in the soup of consciousness in the ocean of consciousness <clears throat> and we simply tap into it mm-hmm. and words are actually inadequate once you tap into it and you see something you realize something you s- attempt to communicate it by words but words uh, actually always fall, to, fall short of the experience all the books in the world could not describe a single leaf <laughs> if you were if you were to describe every atom every placement of the atom its relationship to every other atom in one leaf you could not do it through all the books of the world so reality mm-hmm. is much larger than text mm-hmm. and which is also the big abrahamic error in trying to imagine that any text can govern our life um Correct. it's impossible because text is very limited and reality mm-hmm. is much larger great great answers and great point thank you sankrant for this session really really appreciate what you've said or do you have any uh, parting thought or for our viewers connect to the tradition in your own life right. this is the most right. important thing right connect to sadhana connect to ritual <clears throat> even it's a puja that your mom used to do or whether it is a sadhana that you you pick up you know does not matter which particular sampradaya or path of guru you follow i have my own sam- sampradaya and guru shri shri ravi shankar ji but find someone who resonates with you and 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 do it do the practice that is the most important. thank you sankrant then and uh, you have a great day thank you mm-hmm. bye bye